will start with the characteristics. My liberal Jew. Profession, lawyer, doctor, university lecturer. <laughs> Rafael Adim. Rafael Adim, pediatrician. Okay. Country of your stay, Bucharest, Budapest, Vienna, Prague, Berlin, Warsaw. Prague. Prague. Everybody chooses Prague. I wonder why. <laughs> I know why. <laughs> May I assume, being the liberal Jew that you are, that you are fluent in the Czech language of your country, high, well-educated level of language? Yes. I'm going to ask something, and don't pay attention to the others. Would it be proper to assume that most of your friends are not Jews? Half Many, half and half. Okay. <coughs> Season tickets to the opera, soccer games, theater? What's your choice? All of the above? Theater. Theater. Okay, thank you, sir. <coughs> Two daughters? One son and one daughter. One's piano classes for the daughter? Of course. A piano class? How can you raise a girl in Central Europe prior to World War II without piano? I trust some of you have been raised that way because your parents came from there, right? Girls piano. Okay, right. The boy, any musical instrument or rather sports, do you think? Sports. sports. Tennis? Soccer. Soccer. Okay, tennis. Right. So we have our character, right? Prior to the war. Entertaining any Zionist ideas, perchance? No. No way. Okay. Our Sadmal Hasid. Oh, your name, by the way, sir? Yosef. Yosef. And would you go by Yosef in Prague, like Joseph at the time? Joseph. Joseph would be good, or Your name, sir, my Satmar Hasid. I would say Lion, then. Lionel for a Satmar Hasid. Ah, yeah, you mean yeah, Leib. Yes, yeah. Leib, okay, yeah. that's the name. All right. Do you know where Satmar is? You know where Satmar is. Okay. It's, yeah. At that time, it was Hungary. Now it's Romania. It's the beginning of one of the largest Transylvania. Transylvania. I, the I know. A, a, one of the major Hasidic groups that we have today, the Satmar Hasidim, okay? The Satmar. The Satmar, you know the value. Yeah. Late, eight kids? Well, no, I think it's a good choice. Eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last eight. one he counted. Yeah. Who's counting? Eight kids, okay. Baruch Hashem, you should say. Yeah. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All Yiddish speaking? Yes. Yeah. Of course. Totally unable to function outside of any Jewish circle. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, no, I wouldn't say so, because if you knew German, you'd, you'd be... Satmar Hasidim in Hungary prior to World War II. Would you raise them to know German or to know Torah? Yeah, Torah. Oh, yeah, okay. Totally dysfunctional outside of any Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's not funny. Yeah. We are reaching the part that's extremely painful, but we need to entertain it. Executing you equally. They don't care, doctor, that you are so highly educated. However, who among the two at least has a fighting chance to buy forged documents? to send at least a girl mm. to a hiding place. Who is connected outside Jewish circles? I don't mean it's a security, but at least a chance. Who among the two? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A chance, not security. Maybe, a ch you know, money, connections, a little bit, no. okay? Sometimes devastation in the circles is terrible. Terrible. The man is in a DP camp. You survived. Next thing you hear, I move into fact. Finished with the fiction. You hear in the DP camp, lo and behold, unbelievable, your rabbi, the Satmar rabbi, had survived. Fact. The Vishnitzer rabbi. The Rebbe Vishnitzer, but the Satmar has survived. <coughs> From his perspective, miracle. Huh? Miracle? Miracle! The Rebbe had survived. Yeah, with, with, with some age. Yeah, we don't talk miracle. about it. Miracle, it's the hand of God. The Satan of Hasidi, miracle. Next yeah. thing they tell you, next thing they tell you is that the Rebbe went to New York, to Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. What do you do? No, no, after that, he, he went, yeah, the village itself. But the Satan of Rebbe went to Crown Heights. Yeah. He what was, do you? He was right. What do you do if you are a Satmar Hasid and you hear that? Follow him. Follow him. 
put penny and penny together and go to where the weather is. Because if there is half a chance for life to go back to what it used to be, it will be where the weather is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everybody will want to come, who knows where, maybe one of the girls survived. Maybe a sister of your wife. Maybe a cousin. Who knows? 1946, the Swatmala weather holds a meeting. Fact. Fact. Well, you, of course, will go to the meeting. There were about 40 Hasidim followers <coughs> present. How many women in the meeting? Zero. Sure. Yeah, and who would serve the tea and cake? <laughs> anyway, but if there were women just outside, if a daughter survived, would she be looking from the door just to make sure dad is doing fine? I mean, after what we have lost? Now, you went to that meeting for one reason only. Yeah, there'll be Torah study. Yeah, there'll be maybe a little bit of singing, maybe a little bit schnapps. You know, they're not alcoholics, but they like it. You went there for one thing, only to ask the Rebbe one question. <coughs> Listen to his advice. What to do? To ask the Rebbe one question. And the question is, why? 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 How did it happen? The question is put to the Satma Rebbe in Crown Heights in 1946 by a group of his followers. You would expect a, a leader of his size to hesitate for a moment. Allegedly, the Rebbe did not hesitate for one single moment. You will be upset with the answer. So please remember, I am not a Satma Hasid, I am just a storyteller. It's not my opinion. Don't be mad at me. The Rebbe had said that the Holocaust was a punishment for our sins. What? Mm -hmm. A punishment for our sins. Oh my God. I, I know you'd be upset. I know. But they are Jews as well. We ought to listen. It's part of the narratives going among the larger Jewish family to this day. Now I'm asking you to do something very difficult. Because I am not blind, thank God. And by looking at you, I know that none of you is a Satmar Hasid, not even the gentleman who is the keeper. <laughs> Yet I'm asking you to try and think for a moment, what was the sin according to him? Not according to you members of the JCC in Cleveland or Chicago or whatever. According to him, what was the sin for which God Almighty in his ultimate wisdom had visited the punishment of the Holocaust on his people? Give me one. You, yeah. Not holy enough, not following. We did not follow all the commandments, all the mitzvot, we strayed. So it was mainly because of Jews like him, right? <laughs> okay. No. No. Good thinking, but no. Try again. Try again. What was the sin? According to the Satmar Rebbe, fact, I am not making this up. Parents Israel? Bingo. Thank you. Zionism. Zionism. Your name, ma'am? Gloria. Gloria. Now, some people in the group, since I know you so intimately, and for <laughs> such a length of time, are now going in your... Hang on, Gloria. What do you mean? Isn't Zionism... The ideology that holds the Jews, wherever they are, should aspire to go back to their God-promised land to reestablish a Jewish existence there. How could a Jewish rabbi in his right mind believe that that in itself is a sin punishable by the Holocaust? Your colleagues are thinking, Gloria and Rachel, you must be wrong. Unfortunately, we are not wrong. No, no. no we are not wrong. You do, you do. You do. History in your hands, and you have a good time to wait for the Messiah. So we are not wrong. This is what the Sadmara had said. Yes. I'm saying. Uh, okay. And now we'll elaborate because you got a third of the answer, and I'd like the group to have the two other thirds. So in order to do that, we are now taking you back not to the year 1946. That's nothing in Jewish history. <clears throat> I need to take you back some 1800 years. To Babylon, after the destruction of the temple. Have you done mm -hmm. second temple a little bit? Okay. In the centuries after the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish people moves from Jerusalem 
to the New York of those days, which is Babylon, Iraq of today. Go figure. Okay? <coughs> the center of culture. Huge centers of Jewish learning. Yeshiva, Sora, Pumpedit, and Hav. Still the guideline for Jewish life to this very day. If you, even if you think that your life is not influenced by the Babylonian Talmud because you are a liberal, reform, whatever Jew, and you may think that, you're wrong. You know why? How did you, you and I, liberal Jews, know when to light our Hanukkah candles this year? People tell me my iPod tells me. Thank you. Very nice. How does iPod know? Jewish calendar, Jewish calendar, Babylonian Talmud. Okay? And so on and so forth. Okay. Susan was telling me something about mourning customs, Shiva, etc. How do we know those customs? Babylonian Talmud. I mean, practical things of everyday life, what you bring, what you don't bring, when you come, when you don't come. Okay. One of the things those sages address themselves to is now, 1800 years ago, that we are in Babylon. How do we make sure that we stay alive and Jewish? Big question. Still bothering us to this very day. And they come up with the answer of the three oaths, Shalosh HaShvuot. And they say, we Jews need to commit to three things. And if we do, it doesn't mean that there won't be a local problem here and there. But there won't be total annihilation. It's a deal. You think it's funny? Let's explore what those three things are. What is the first promise, commitment, oath, we need to take in order to make sure that we stay alive and Jewish, according to the Babylonian sages of the Talmud? It's so classical of how we think of Judaism. Sir, they were so much more practical. Oath number one, do not rebel against the nations. Wherever you live, live by the law of the country. Can you imagine way before Shabbat, be away? It was so practical. They understood that once you stray away from your country and you live among others, you will need to be loyal to the regime. Otherwise, one of us will rebel and who will be punished? Everyone, because that's the way with minorities. One misbehaves and we all pay. And it doesn't matter what regime. Okay? Rule number two, again, not so bad. Do not climb the walls. What does it mean? What walls? What climbing? If a place, they say, is encircled by a real or virtual wall, and they, the others, the Goyim, the non-Jews, say the Jews are not to enter, stay out, for God's sake. Do not force your entry by climbing the wall. Let us take a few examples of those walls. Poland in Middle Ages, capital city, Krakow, not Warsaw at the time, encircled by a wall. Jews are not allowed to enter. What do they do? Have any of you been to Poland? Yes. Where is the Jewish settlement in Krakow? Just outside of the walls of the old city. They couldn't come in? Fine. You settle outside, go in during the day for the business, come out at night, don't force your entry. How about Palestine under British mandate? Are Jews allowed to come in freely? No, no they're not. Let's take an example.